Vote for your favorite K-pop of 2022. Visit 17karatkpop.substack.com for the link, and the results will be revealed on a December episode of the show. And please subscribe while you're at it, 17karatkpop.substack.com. Thank you. Hi everybody, welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop and the last episode of Stay Tuned for 2022. Stay Tuned episodes cover more broad music industry, music world news that's indirectly related to K-Pop usually, especially today. K-Pop fans, listen up. This affects all concert goers, all fandoms, because today's big topic, what the heck happened when people tried to buy Taylor Swift tickets, the actual history behind it, and the very fascinating, odd, bizarre circumstance that allowed for it to happen. I'll explain. It's way more interesting than it sounds, the business and legal side of the story. Let's do it. Let's just dive in. What usually happens when there's high demand for concert tickets through Ticketmaster is there's some sort of system, some sort of tiered system, lottery system, a way to pare down who's buying tickets at the same time so the site doesn't crash. The site can still crash, like in the case of BTS with the pre-sale, all the tickets sold out in the pre-sale period, but they try. But sometimes just too many people, even in the pared down early rounds of selling tickets, sell them out. So this is not new. What is new and historic is the demand for these new Taylor Swift tickets. Ticketmaster was like, yeah, we got this. We can handle high demand events like this, especially because we have that verified fan early sale, which whittled down the people on the site to about four times Ticketmaster's previous peak. Over 3.5 million people had pre-registered for these tickets. Two million tickets were sold, breaking a one-day record for the site. But a lot of people were really ticked off to not be one of those 2 million. Over 1.5 million people who had registered could not participate because so many bots ate up these tickets and the demand was just intense. It was such chaos, everyone scrambling to get those tickets at the same time. Ayer quickly turned towards resale sites like StubHub who buy up tickets on the primary market and sell them for more money secondary. Then people started to really turn on the site itself, realizing that Ticketmaster has no incentive to go after the stub hubs of the world. In fact, it's the opposite, because they pocket more money with every resale of a ticket. They did issue an official apology, and it's being reported as if it's causal, but that's not the case. Previously, before these tickets went on sale, the Justice Department had already been investigating. They already had this inquiry going into the Ticketmaster monopolization of the ticket industry. The Live Nation CEO, Live Nation is owned by Ticketmaster, he cracked a joke at an Investor Day conference about all the attendees there having Taylor Swift tickets under their seats, so he's taking it well. This is something there will be a Senate hearing on, how Ticketmaster is able to monopolize the market. Part of that is because it's so many parts of the live music experience. It's in charge of venues, tickets, artist teams. It has control over all of that. And currently, scan fees are costing as much as 78% of a concert ticket price these days. You also fiasco sometimes, like with Bruce Springsteen tickets, where a sliding scale is implemented, meaning that the higher the demand, the higher the price for your seat gets. So if you have a huge artist, that's going to be an exorbitant price at the end of the day. Although Taylor herself actually opted out of that sliding scale pricing. But that is an option, another source of anger at Ticketmaster lately. Resale sites are also the subject of ire because New York actually has ticket transparency rules regarding ticket prices. More on that later. But resale sites kind of can skirt those rules that are focused on primary sites. A very lengthy statement was issued by Ticketmaster. In response to all of this anger, Ticketmaster issued a statement quite defensive, and it's very lengthy, so I'll just skip around, but this is what it says. What it says in part, quote, As we have stated many times in the past, Live Nation takes its responsibilities under the antitrust laws seriously and does not engage in behaviors that could justify antitrust litigation. The concert promotion business is highly competitive. The demand for live entertainment continues to grow. That Ticketmaster continues to be the leader in such an environment is a testament to the platform, not to any anti-competitive business practices. No serious argument can be made that Ticketmaster has the kind of market position that supports antitrust claims. Ticketmaster is the most transparent and fan-friendly ticketing system in the United States. 
We are proud of the work we do across both concerts and ticketing, and will continue working to improve. Ticketmaster does not set or control ticket prices, strongly advocates for all in-house pricing, and is the undisputed market leader in ticket security and fighting bots, unquote. There have actually been huge ticket resale scams in the past on Ticketmaster, so their claim of being the most fan-friendly should raise some eyebrows because there was this huge wise guy tickets fiasco. Before the FBI raided their place and shut it down, there was this whole ring of ticket brokers who actually found loopholes in Ticketmaster software and then were able to buy in bulk these tickets. They got over a million tickets. They were eventually charged with wire fraud and unauthorized computer access. Some of them were actually based in Bulgaria. It was a whole big ring with a leader and everything. They actually recruited people into this prior scheme who had previously worked for Ticketmaster, who wanted to help the enemy basically be an informant, provide their intel. Then you could earn, by giving them that intel, over $1,000 a month writing the code that would break the CAPTCHA, other prove you're not a robot, obstacles, bypass that stuff, and make it look like an individual customer was buying a ticket, but it was really in bulk, a bot. They messed with the algorithms, long story short, and made literally millions doing so. This was between 2002 and 2009, but it's not irrelevant to bring up now, because this has happened before. Ticketmaster did catch on before the FBI got involved, tried to implement reCAPTCHA to surpass CAPTCHA, but they also found their way around. That layer of protection, too, it was a mess. So how did Ticketmaster become the go-to monopoly it is on the ticket world? This is where I think it gets really ridiculous. Let's go back to 2007. Ticketmaster runs over 82% of the U.S. ticket market. They are just thriving. They're on top of the world. But they have a competitor, Live Nation. Live Nation is thriving and the only real risk to them. The only one who could kind of catch up in this race and maybe surpass them someday. It's sort of like when Facebook saw the increasing popularity of younger people on Instagram and felt threatened and then bought Instagram. Just buying the competition so they can't surpass you. You own them. And that's what Ticketmaster sought out to do. They had a relationship that ended in 2007, though. And Live Nation said, we want nothing to do with you. We're starting our own thing. Flash forward to 2009, Ticketmaster went from controlling around 82% of the ticket market to 66%. Still the majority. But they didn't like the direction that was headed. So in 2010, Live Nation and Ticketmaster do decide to team up. And they merge. Michael Rapino, Live Nation CEO, told the New York Times in an interview, yeah, the goal was to make Ticketmaster the Amazon of live music, your one-stop shop for venue, ticket, and artist info. That is actually a very apt comparison in hindsight, too, because Amazon has done that before, where they buy out what might gain traction. Amazon bought Whole Foods, for example, and wants to be known as a grocery store in addition to everything else. Companies do this not just to get rid of competition, but because any fees they have to take, they give to their clients, who they own. They can say, hey, we're not being a monopoly because we are giving away part of our profits to our clients, but the clients are who they own. If Amazon said, well, we don't pocket all that money, we give some away to Whole Foods, that's laughable. I don't pocket that money. I give it to children of mine, right? It's, it's running in the family. And so that's what they said. Ticketmaster was like, we pay our clients, which include Live Nation. Bruce Springsteen actually was vocal against the merger back then, saying it would make the ticketing situation worse. This is the part that I find so darkly funny. Just ridiculous. The Department of Justice gets to decide if you get to merge a company, if it doesn't violate certain anti-monopoly, antitrust rules. And they decided this looks fine, this is not a monopoly, we approve this merger, but you just have to follow this consent decree. And consent decrees, to me, basically read like recommendations. If it's not a law, if it's not a hard rule, if it's a consent decree, that's like a can you please do this list of items. It's very toothless in comparison. Hey, we would like if you did this. Could you do that? It's just so not pushy. It's kind of like an honor system. And it's probably not a good idea to have certain people follow an honor system. But that's what happened. They said, this can happen, but you have to follow the consent decree. And what was in that decree? 
Live Nation had to promise they wouldn't retaliate against venues who tried using a different ticket site. So for example, if an artist for the Chicago Theater wanted to sell their Chicago Theater show tickets on insert site name here, but it's not Live Nation or Ticketmaster, Live Nation shouldn't punish that artist or the Chicago Theater in the future for doing that, for picking competition. Another part of the decree was saying Ticketmaster would have to sell a different subsidiary, Passiolan, to Comcast, which actually wasn't bad because that had about 2% of the ticketing market, so sure, we'll get rid of it. They also had to license certain software for the rival AEG to also have access to, and a few other things. The head of this division at the DOJ at the time, Christine Varney, called this, quote, vigorous antitrust enforcement only with a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer, unquote. They were defensive of this agreement. They thought this would work out. Turns out they started violating this consent decree pretty much as soon as they signed it. It turns out that AEG never paid royalty fees on the ticketing software they were granted access to. So that's a whole other story. This is also just a bonkers decision, if you ask me. In 2019, the DOJ finally was like, we're going to crack down on Live Nation. We see what's happening. You're violating the consent decree, and now you'll pay. So they tweaked the language of the agreement. There were a couple of things they could have done. They could have really beefed up punishments for those who violate the decree. They could have sued to just unwind the merger. Or they could just tweak the language, update the decree add some clarifications. That's the option they chose. So instead of some big drama, they thought they could just basically say, don't do it again. And that's what they did. So the updated decree, the real hardcore intimidating one now, had a clarification about, remember, you're not supposed to intimidate venues. You're not supposed to retaliate if they don't work with you. It also extended the decree for five more years and declared future violations will result in fines, so beware, but everything so far kind of untouched. Also, this new modified version requires an investigator to monitor potential violations. Basically, it's like having a fellow student be named the hall monitor. Not much they can do, they can refer, but they're just sort of, it's a lot of optics and that's it. So long story short, the merger was allowed on odd circumstances. Turns out they were violating the rules and were told, don't do it again. Here's an updated list of rules. And they've probably gone back to violating it. And that's where it stands today. So there's no incentive for Ticketmaster to stop with buying into the secondary market. It's all benefit, no punishment. Why wouldn't they? They get a pay cut every time a ticket's resold. Or their clients get the pay cut, which they now own. In an early 2021 earnings call, Rapino championed the, quote, aggressive continued consolidation path, unquote, and was excited about the good stock performance of the company. Over the last couple of years, Live Nation has even bought up a startup called Rival and a few international ticket companies. So Live Nation is buying up potential future competition. Live Nation also bought a majority stake in Veeps, a streaming platform. Meanwhile, in 2022, Live Nation has had its biggest ever summer concert season. Compared to this time last year, their quarterly revenue is up 63%, and their net income is up from over $86 million to $397 million. They also report double-digit attendance growth, their words, double-digit, even compared to pre-pandemic times 2019. And compared to 2019, Ticketmaster's gross revenue is up by 62%. Overall, this past summer, over 44 million fans attended over 11,000 events. Live Nation benefited quite a bit from pandemic relief money the government had saved for small music venues. Nearly 19 million actually went to Live Nation or subsidiaries they had bought. So where things stand now, people who didn't get Taylor Swift tickets are out of luck. Unless this upcoming, as of recording time, upcoming Senate hearing changes things, causes an unwinding of the merger, which would mean less incentive to have people screw with your ability to get concert tickets, basically. There would be more competition, so they might fleece you less. That's the short way of putting it. So if not an unwinding of the merger, they might at least tweak the consent decree more after a Senate hearing. I wouldn't get too excited, though. It's probably not likely for a full unwinding. 
That just does not happen. But individual states have tried to do what they can to combat sketchy behavior. New York actually signed a bill into law this past summer that basically makes sure, well, if you're going to get screwed over, at least you get to know how screwed over you are. It banned hidden fees during ticket sales. And it also banned delivery fees on tickets you can print at home. The law also increased the penalties for proven bot usage or similar deceptive behavior, even if the upcoming Senate hearing does not change this toothless consent decree or the merger. It could help create information factored into future state laws regarding transparency in overall ticket sale success. That's the state of play. It is a wild world. How quickly mergers can get a small slap on the wrist. Speaking of uh, really interesting stories, let's talk about the study showing rats kept rhythm like humans popping to Lady Gaga. A University of Tokyo study tried to see if rats have rhythm and can keep rhythm like humans can. And they could at the exact same beats per minute as a human can, around 132. They also actually bopped less to it and were kind of thrown off when the music was sped up or slowed down. In addition to Born This Way by Lady Gaga, the rats got to listen to Sugar by Maroon 5, Beat It by Michael Jackson, Another One Bites the Dust by Queen, and a Mozart piano piece. And they were bopping the whole time pretty much. What researchers found so interesting is not so much if the rats have rhythm, like Happy Feet New York or something, but if the rats could mirror human behavior, which opens up some interesting potential for future research that could benefit humans. I do want to kind of rain on your parade a bit now, to be honest, because the headlines made this sound way cooler than it was actually. You see the headline, oh my gosh, rats dance to Lady Gaga says science. I mean, that sounds incredible. But there are a couple things I want want to clarify once you actually read the study that it tells you. One is that these head movements that were used to study rats bopping a lawn, they were studied at like a microscopic level with special sensors. It was not like you could visibly see these rats busting a move on the dance floor. This was like imperceptible to the naked eye. So the dancing, not as cute to watch as you'd think. Second thing to note, the rat's head movements might not have really been about keeping up with the rhythm, but might have just been more a result of being startled by the music in the first place, unsure what to make of it. So some scholars say this is way too early to find any definitive conclusion in, but it sure is interesting, especially because there was a recent separate study that showed a similar phenomenon in seals, that seals could keep rhythm and tempo, even depth in music. They had kind of a natural ability to get music, which could be helpful for studying the origins of human speech, how we retain information without really trying, just our environments help us. There are a bunch of miscellaneous headlines in the world of music and tech and culture today that I want to share. If you want me to do a further episode of Stay Tuned, really digging more into these topics, feel free to let me know if something stands out. But here are just other happenings. Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center has gotten a makeover focused on the study of psychoacoustics, which can help craft a venue to have different acoustics given our advanced knowledge now of how people take in events. So basically, a better listening experience, knowing more about how humans listen to music. The New York Philharmonic conductor had an interesting quote about that. Young people listen with their eyes. This hall needs to be not just for us, but for the next century. The U.S. House of Representatives has introduced the RAP Act, aka Restoring Artist Protection Act, which limits the use of artistic expression from being used as evidence against someone in a criminal case. Because in the past, it's been common to, especially with rap, take lyrics and use them as evidence against someone, saying you used this lyric to threaten so-and-so, directly or indirectly. A similar piece of legislation passed at the state level signed into law in California, the Decriminalizing Artistic Expression Act. Meek Mill and Killer Mike were some of the people virtually in attendance of the signing ceremony. Spotify is engaging in a small test phase of having its own concert ticket platform in app, which is very interesting in hindsight of all this negative press going to its potential future competition. Another interesting recent Spotify revelation. 
Although back in 2020, only 13% of the global weekly chart songs were older than 18 months old. Only 13% were older than 18 month songs. This year, 33% of the songs people are listening to are older than 18 months. People are getting nostalgic. YouTube now allows short form videos to use 30 to 60 seconds of licensed music. In most cases, the previous limit was 15 seconds. Neptune, a gaming company from South Korea, has a subsidiary focused on AI called OnMind, and they recently announced Suwa, a digital star, a CGI idol, has signed an exclusive three-year modeling contract with their help, and will now represent an ad firm for Thailand. Coachella's parent company is suing Afrochella, claiming copyright infringement. Afrochella is an Afrobeats-themed celebration in Ghana. In early October, Coachella filed this lawsuit over that name, and this is actually three years after AEG sent a warning letter to Afrochella that went unheeded. In more legal news, there is a class action lawsuit music superfans filed against MoFi, claiming their high quality audio service has been misrepresented and does not match the definition of a high quality audio experience. Basically, they claim MoFi has been, quote, using digital mastering or digital files, unquote, since 2011, while continuing to, quote, misrepresent to consumers that it did not use digital mastering, while still charging the same price premium, unquote. The music industry is changing its tune about TikTok. Originally, it was just kind of happy for songs to get exposure, on TikTok, because it can go viral overnight, incredible algorithm, next level. You could be a nobody with no followers and go viral easily, compared to other apps. You don't have to build up a following first. Really incredible for budding artists. But now, it's become so big that more music companies want some of the money. Instead of just charging a flat fee for TikTok to use certain songs, they want to charge a fee and a percent of the revenue generated from using that song. TikTok might actually be able to legally beat back this request, though, because they could argue substantially. They serve as just promo help. They shouldn't need to share revenue because they share revenue in the form of, in the form of free publicity. It also could work in their favor or actually against them. Could go either way. The argument that TikTok needs music to exist. After all, TikTok started as a lip sync app. It owes the music industry. Apparently, TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, has floated the idea of renaming Reso, their own music service, TikTok Music, to indicate a correlation. But that has not been seriously considered, just an idea reportedly floated. Currently, Reso Music only operates in three market regions, and China's big enough that that's still a lot of people it can reach, but of course that's different than the global interest you would get calling it TikTok Music instead. The Economist has some interesting new reporting on the, what they call, multipolar state of pop culture. Some recent trends about what's most popular in the media really shows the globalization of pop culture. Partly, of course, social media is to thank for that, but an underrated part is the impact of financial growth in different countries and rising in disposable income in some of them. They say as indicating this multipolar pop culture that the most watched show on Netflix is Korean, the most popular TikTok star is Sengalese in Italian, the most streamed song on Spotify is from a Puerto Rican artist, and that over the past five years, the English language tracks on the list of most streamed 100 songs on the app has dropped significantly. It used to be English language tracks made up 52% of the top 100 list. Now it's 31, and specifically in Spain and Latin America, English songs now are 14% of the list as opposed to 25. And lastly, in audio news, a group of A-list comedians are suing Pandora, saying they've been underpaid or not paid, period, for segments Pandora has aired of their comedy, without obtaining proper license to do so. Those who spoke to the rap called this legal case potentially the Napster of comedy. Pandora has been defensive, though, and says long-standing precedent has allowed their strategy to stay as is. They've gone so far as to claim the plaintiffs are asking for quote-unquote radical change that would amount to illegal price fixing if they actually paid them what they say they're owed. 
It's just a whole new ball game with streaming comedy, books, songs. Streaming instead of physical sales has just upended everything. These fights over who gets what cut of what pay, which is a diminished pay at the end of the day, it's an ongoing fight between parties, which I could spend hours longer talking about the particulars of because it's a fascinating world that we're still coming to grips with, but that's where I'll leave it for now. Thank you all for tuning in today. Let me know if any of these topics you'd like a follow-up about on 2023's episodes of Stay Tuned. Until then, thank you all for listening, and I'll talk to you all again very soon. Bye, everybody!